In this video, I'm going to talk about the diagnosis and treatment of herpes simplex virus infections. And my specific learning objectives are three. One, to describe a diagnostic approach uh, to herpes infections. A second, to discuss the role of antiviral therapy in the treatment of HSV infections. And finally, to explain strategies to prevent HSV infections. The diagnostic approach to herpes infections is summarized on this slide. Um, there are several ways that one can infer that a her or prove that a herpes infection is present. One is that if you have a biopsy of tissue uh, that is infected with herpes, there may be some specific histologic features that may be seen, such as giant cells or intranuclear inclusions. This is not uh, particularly specific uh, or definitive. A more specific and definitive way is to do something called a DFA, a direct fluorescent antibody test for herpes, as is demonstrated uh, in this picture. For this, antibodies against herpes simplex virus are labeled with fluorescein. A specimen from a suspected infected patient is obtained. The specimen is dried, such as vesicular fluid, is dried, and then the antibody is overlaid on the specimen. It is washed, and if the antibody finds the herpes antigen, it sticks and it lights up under fluorescent microscopy. And this is quite specific and quite sensitive. An even more sensitive way to diagnose herpes is by using polymerase chain reaction, the methodology of replicating DNA to a point that it is easily detectable. And this is used frequently now for diagnosing herpes infections, especially in the brain. Viral culture is another way to diagnose herpes infections. For this, the specimen, the, the suspected infected specimen, whether it's vesicular fluid or a brain biopsy, is sent to the virology laboratory, put on tissue cultures which support the growth of herpes viruses, and then the tissue culture is subsequently examined to see if it's got evidence of herpes simplex virus. And finally, but it would be much more slow, you can diagnose herpes infections by using serology, looking for antibody directed against HSV-1 and HSV-2. It takes 10 days to two weeks for antibody to form, so therefore this diagnostic test is relatively slow. This test also doesn't necessarily distinguish between HSV-1 and HSV-2, unless you use the very special tests that are based upon glycoprotein differences between HSV-1 and HSV-2. So that's the diagnosis of HSV infections. With regards to antiviral therapy, this is our antiviral target map, and I'll draw your attention to the part related to herpes infections. The antivirals used to treat HSV infections mostly work by inhibiting viral DNA polymerase. Um, and acyclovir is the drug, or, or a derivatives of acyclovir, are the drugs used for treating HSV and, and VZV infections. This table summarizes other antiviral agents that may be used for treating HSV infections, but as I emphasized on the prior slide, acyclovir is the one that is most commonly used. This table summarizes the name of the antiviral agents, the mechanism of action, which is principally uh, the interruption or the inhibition of viral DNA preliminase, and if the antiviral, if resistance develops, the usual mechanism for that resistance. I'll leave it to you to look at this table in your leisure. This table summarizes where antiviral agents are effective in the treatment of different herpes infections. And there are two slides, this one and the next. Um, with regards to oral herpes infections, there is some marginal benefit for treating with antivirals, but because many of the oral infections are quite mild, they often are not treated. They simply go away on their own. The exception would be a, a child, for example, with severe gingiva stomatitis. There also is some utility of antiviral therapy in prophylaxis against frequently recurring oral infections, although uh, there's not a broad use of antivirals for that purpose. 
With regards to genital infections, there is good data that show that if you have a, a man or a woman presenting with a, with a symptomatic primary infection and they're quite sick, they're coming into hospital or they're coming into your clinic, um, you can give antiviral therapy, again, usually a cyclovir, and this will ameliorate those uh, severe symptoms. With regards to recurrent genital infections, antiviral therapy is not as effective because recurrent infections are so short to begin with, you can't really accrue very much benefit. With regards to eye infections caused by herpes, which may be sight-threatening, topical antiviral therapies are beneficial and certainly are used. And with regards to cutaneous infections, if they're severe, such as those occurring in persons with eczema or burns, then antiviral therapy is often used, although there are not a lot of controlled trials that have demonstrated the utility of that use. On this slide are uh, indications where antiviral therapy must be used because these infections may be so severe. So in neonates, Antiviral therapy, again, usually a cyclovir, has been demonstrated to reduce the morbidity and mortality of neonatal infections. A cyclovir is a drug of choice, and there is no question that it must be used in an infected neonate. In an individual with herpes encephalitis, because the untreated mortality rate is so high, about 70%, antiviral therapy must be used for this indication. And oftentimes, because herpes infections may be very severe in compromised hosts, for example, patients who receive bone marrow transplants or have some kind of immunodeficiency, antiviral therapy is generally used. But recognize that if you end up using antiviral therapy in these hosts for a long period of time, resistance may be developed, and you may be using one of the alternate antivirals shown on a prior table. And finally, some comments about the prevention of herpes infections. Well, so ideally, if you could avoid contact, that would be tr terrific. Um, with sexually transmitted infections, which are mostly relevant to HSV type 2, abstinence uh, would prevent you from getting the infection. Condoms are effective to some degree, and antiviral therapy has some, uh, some limited utility uh, when taken by the uninfected partner uh, of a relationship where one member has herpes and the other does not. Uh, avoiding contact in vertical transmission, meaning from mother to child, uh, the strategies there are either performing a cesarean section and delivering the baby abdominally as opposed to through infected genital secretions. So there's indications for that under certain circumstances. Um, and there may be a role for antiviral therapy to pregnant women, although that role uh, is uh, not dramatic and not uh, completely defined, but, but often used. And finally, prophylactic antiviral therapy may be useful under some limited circumstances. So for example, for persons who have frequently recurrent oral herpes or frequently recurrent genital herpes or even ocular herpes, prophylactic therapy, giving a cyclovir typically over long periods of time to suppress the recurrence of the infections has been shown to be effective under limited circumstances. Certainly vaccination against any infectious disease is the holy grail. Unfortunately, uh, vaccination against herpes simplex virus has not yet been realized, and it's not been for lack of effort in developing an effective vaccine. Trials are still under, are, are ongoing, but there is no licensed effective vaccine against HSV-1 or HSV-2.